All right, looks like we have a critical mass and are ready to get started here. Uh, welcome. So we are here for some opening remarks from Commissioner Mike Morath. Uh, and I'll give a brief introduction here. Uh, so Commissioner Mike Morath has been a champion of the system of great schools since its inception in 2017. Uh, the commissioner often says uh, he has the best job in the world because he wakes up every morning working to make things better for five and a half million kids across the state of Texas. Um, and I can personally attest now, having worked with the commissioner over the past year, uh, this very unusual year at that, that the commissioner truly shows up with an unwavering dedication to supporting those five and a half million students every single day. Um, so we're really excited to have the commissioner here uh, once again on the SGS Summit stage. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Commissioner, to get us started. Thanks, Mega. I uh, uh, just as a quick housekeeping check, I want to make sure I'm sharing my screen successfully and I uh, can just go ahead and fire it through this. For successfully sharing your screen, I, I do want to double check uh, whether we're seeing a, a bit of a flashing screen here. Oh, I think we are we're good now. Okay, great. Well, um, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining uh, the, the conference today. Um, and much more importantly, thanks for your work. Um, I'm grateful for the team that we have at TEA and I'm grateful for the work of all of our school system leaders around the state of Texas. This has been one extraordinary year and um, uh, it, it has been filled with every challenge imaginable and some uh, not really imaginable. Um, and um, through all of it, through the long hours, the emotional um, uh, uh, toil that we've all gone through, I, I remain tremendously grateful that our kids have access to the leaders in this virtual room um, that um, uh, uh, that we have um, this uh, army of skilled um, soldiers for children that are that are fighting, um, uh, that are driving change, that are working to create opportunities for kids, um, even in extremely challenging times. And um, uh, this particular group, this conference, is um, about a, a a especially innovative group of leaders that um, are uh, interested in both seeing and executing the world uh, differently. That we recognize that we live in a world today where not all of our children have um, have access to the quality of education that we know that they morally deserve. Um, it is, um, you know, the 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 data tells the story fairly um, uh, clearly that the, the mission, the goal, this, this vision of public education to be the great equalizer is true in many places, but not true um, uh, uh, everywhere and not true for every student. This um, graph paints a picture before uh, coronavirus set in of roughly um, you know, top to bottom where we are in, in terms of, of delivering the educational quality for our kids that they deserve. And, and, you can see right off the bat, first bar on the left hand side speaks to some strategies um, uh, that we will need to invest in because when kids enter our system at five years of age, only about half of them are ready for basic lessons in literacy and numeracy that um, we see um, in at kindergarten. And so this speaks to a whole set of activity that we have to collectively engage in in the zero to five space with the work that we do with pre-K and strengthening families, um, you know, parents as a child's first teacher. Um, the, the next four bars, um, which have, you know, question marks because we don't, um, we didn't have uh, data from, or from 2020, um, show where our students are in terms of their mathematics and reading proficiency on grade level in third and eighth grade. and and. You can see slightly fewer than half of our kids are, are reading and, and doing math on grade level in third grade. Um, and it gets better the uh, older they are, the longer we have them in our system. Um, so we're a little bit above 50% um, uh, in terms of, of reading and math proficiency in eighth grade. 
only about 18% of our kids meet the college readiness bar as set by SAT and ACT. That's a 24 on the ACT, it's 1110 on the SAT. Um, and so clearly we have work to do to embed um, top to bottom academic rigor uh, in, in what our kids have access to. Although our four-year graduation rate um, is remains at an all-time high, 90% of kids in Texas graduate um, fr um, from high school in four years with all the requisite credits uh, to earn a, um, a diploma in Texas. Uh, when we think about uh, enrollment in post-secondary, and that could be what you think of as a tr traditional college, four years, could be a two-year um, uh, community college, could be a trade school. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a big dip between the uh, percentage of kids who graduate and then go on to continue their educational opportunities, and and uh, six years after high school graduation. So I think the average 24 year old in Texas who has completed our system, and they could actually be beyond the borders of Texas here. But six years after high school graduation, the percentage of kids who obtain a, a four year degree, a two year associate, um, or even just a, 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 a even a meaningful trade credential, um, it's less than a third of our kids get there. So this is what the environment was pre-COVID. And it speaks to the kinds of changes that we uh, need to make. What I can tell you as a group today, and what we will, um, we are still uh, in the process of chewing um, on this data internally, and hope, hopefully we'll have um, clean data to release um, next week, is that while we had many challenges um, before COVID hit, the challenges of COVID are extraordinary. Um, and to put it in some perspective, uh, preliminary information uh, with regard to the statewide impact of COVID is nothing short of catastrophic. Um, at the third grade level, um, you see a significant uh, reduction in grade level mastery in third grade um, for our kids and a, um, uh, what is quite possibly the most significant decline in mathematics achievement in state history uh, in, um, in third grade. And the, and the other uh, grades um, uh, uh, do not, are, not, are not materially different um, uh, than this. Um, this is the work that we have to do coming out of COVID uh, to make an impact on our kids. But I wanna, I wanna reflect on the fact that not every kid experiences this average. Um, when, we, when we look at pre-COVID numbers, the difference between the haves and the have-nots was stark. And I will tell you that these numbers have only gotten exacerbated um, in, the, in the time of COVID. Um, and again, we'll, we're, we're a few more days away from being able to release the, that information um, for the state as a whole. But 61% but of third graders who are uh, not low income, not from low income families are reading at grade level. 35% of third graders who are low income were reading at grade level. And this again is pre-COVID. So all these numbers are actually much worse now. Um, uh, and it, it speaks to the fact that, um, you know, we, we periodically look at average data um, with, with actually with some frequency. I think reflect on my time as a school board member in Dallas. Um, but our kids don't you know, experience averages. It reminds me of the old sob. I mean, you know, I got, I got one foot on a block of ice and one foot on the stove. So my average temperature is just fine. Like that's not, that's not the way um, our kids experience the world. That's not the way they experience our schools. And it, this, this insight, this examination of data, this relentless commitment to an equitable experience for our kids is I think um, part and parcel what it means to be a district that is committed to, to a system of great schools. Uh, but it means looking at this data with, with very clear eyes and thinking about it uh, and, and in terms of the action plans that you would build on a differential basis. We think of those state averages for the low-income students and state averages for non-low-income students. Um, uh, for low-income students, um, again, the, the, um, the average proficiency was 61%. Um, uh, in third grade reading and 35% um, for economically disadvantaged in third grade reading. But breaking it down by, um, by race shows very significant differences as well, even when isolating for poverty. You see Asian students who are, whether rich or poor, significantly above that state average. White students who are right at that state average. Hispanic students who are noticeably below. 
and African American students um, uh, who, again, regardless of rich or poor, we see big differences um, uh, by race in the experience that our students have and the outcomes that we are achieving for our students, the level of literacy that we are achieving for our students. Um, and in fact, when we think about students in special education, the differences are even more profound. Again, this is all data that our system um, uh, showed pre-COVID, and these numbers are only uh, worse now. The other thing that I think we need to reflect on from the data that was pre-COVID was how successful are we as a system in taking students who are below grade level and getting them uh, uh, above grade level or getting them to grade level. And the, um, the, the unvarnished look at our system historically, uh, and again, this is the average and our students don't experience average, is for all the students who are below grade level in let's say third grade reading in 2017, we fast forward one year to 2018, you know, about 20 to 25% of those kids, um, we accelerated uh, to get to approaches grade level. In the following year, about 6,000 kids, so maybe 5% of those third graders, we got um, to, to meet grade level within two years of being below grade level. Across all grades and subjects, because again, this is just the third grade to fifth grade path and reading, our success rate is only 4% in taking kids who are below grade level and getting them to catch up. And when you reflect on the fact that we had, what, roughly a million kids top to bottom in the system that, uh, you know, regardless of grade or subject, that were below grade level before COVID. And we are likely close to 2 million students who are below grade level um, after COVID. This challenge of driving acceleration um, is something that we as a system have got to make significant operational adjustments to, um, to improve because it is, not, it is not tenable that we continue uh, um, in the way that the system has been designed and in the results that the system has been getting given the disruption that our kids have experienced for the last, what, 15 months, change is necessary. That's what we see from the data. The data is compellingly clear that significant changes in practice are necessary. The question that we ask, the question that this group of highly innovative and reflective leaders has to ask is, what changes should we make and how can we make those changes most effectively to, to, to get the most good for the most kids in the shortest period of time? And, and this is really the backdrop of the thinking associated with um, SGS as a theory of action, the system of great schools. When we think of what it means to be a system of great schools, we actually think of a belief system that pervades a bunch of district strategic choices. SGS is fundamentally a strategy choice at the district level to solve problems in ways that are different um, historically than the way that we look at the, the problems that our, our kids face. Um, uh, it it Im embedded in um, districts that uh, take the plunge in the SGS thought process is that children experience schools, not districts uh, on average. Um, and that we as leaders of these school systems need to be open to every option in, in achieving uh, gains for our kids as quickly as possible. This is a this is a relentless openness to options by any means necessary to get um, outcomes improvements for our kids. It is it is this it is this driving belief system um, uh, to S in in SGS districts that says let's 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 be reflective of whatever blinders that we may have um, on the way that we view the problems of the world and remove those blinders um, and start to see uh, uh, more options on the table for our kids. And then if those options show promise, then let's pursue them. Um, it's, it's also about the idea that um, uh, specialization and academic coherence matter a great deal. Um, uh, we, we have, you know, for a hundred years had a model of a comprehensive school at the elementary, middle school and high school level that um, uh, you know, we'll take all comers and we will uh, give them all um, you know, great things. And I think what you see in districts that embrace the SGS theory of action is a recognition that it is not possible to achieve excellence when we are all things to all people, that we have to, to build a degree of academic coherence and specialization in order to achieve excellence. 
Um, and this uh, means that we look at differentiation in the, in the school experience in a much more uh, uh, thorough way. Um, uh, uh, but, it, but it also, um, when doing so, we have to recognize that, you know, we do, are not the, the owners of all wisdom in this experience, that we as the deliverers of educational services are one piece of the um, equation, but we have to recognize our own weakness and fallibility. And that a parent is in fact the child's first teacher and that the systems level choices that we make as educators cannot be um, cannot be uh, embedded in this um, blind faith in, in uh, you know, the t uh, in technocratic solutions that we actually have to make systemic choices that empower families to make uh, children to make choices for their children that uh, that meet their needs um, uh, most effectively. Um, and and the choices that we set up has to em empower those families um, uh, to to make um, to make their own choices. This is this is I think a um, this is a this is a this is a, a belief system that um, is embedded I think in all districts that pursue SGS. And it's a it's a spectrum. Believe me, this is a this is a journey that we're all on. But I think core to districts that embrace this um, theory of action. Is uh, is the belief in these these things that we have a, we have so much life experience as educators as parents um, as reflecting on our own experience as students that we think that these are truths that we have to pursue and we have to figure out how to operationalize. What we have tried to do at TEA is figure out how one can act on this philosophy um, in a methodical and a systemic way because it cannot be you know, a thousand random acts of kindness. That's not how greatness is pursued. It is discipline. It is, meth it is methodical. Uh, it is relentless, uh, continuous improvement. And so um, when we think about pursuing SGS, we think about four key levers. Um, it starts with goal setting. It starts with engineering for the end in mind that we will, in fact, set, it, set North Star goals for our children um, that in some ways are different. And we'll talk about that. And then we will get relentless in planning around those, that North Star uh, goal. Um, uh, lever two is that we will focus on the options that we create for our kids. We'll be very, very reflective and thoughtful about the kinds of experiences that we want our kids to have and expand those um, experiences by any means necessary. Um, when you have a degree of differentiation in your system, um, uh, you have to be very thoughtful about access. Um, I mean, the, one of the key driving forces behind SGS is the way to achieve equity is not uniformity, but it's actually differentiation. And, and, um, and this means that the, the structures that we have in the district have to be built uh, with a relentless focus on equitable access for our families. Um, and, and, and it entails operational changes that in some cases are not popular. Um, but they are, uh, in many cases, the right thing to do. Um, and the last key lever is, is about institutionalizing the change. This is a, uh, this is a radical experiment in bureaucracy. <laughs> and you're going to have to modify your bureaucratic structures in order to be successful long term um, uh, in this approach. This is, um, and so these are, the, I think, the, the four key levers um, to the system. So let's, let's talk about this lever one, setting the right North Star goal. Um, and getting very systematic about planning uh, to achieve that goal. When, when we looked at that first bar chart that I presented, um, you know, at the beginning of this, this, that bar chart in and of itself was a presentation of the averages for our students. Uh, and I, but, but we got to recognize that our students do not experience averages. There are students that are in phenomenal schools that are getting phenomenal educational opportunities in in texas public education and then there are school there are students who are not um and so when we think about um uh, even the setting the, the the goals at you know for for boards that are going through a very reflective process with their leadership teams about setting goals you think okay i you know what's my goal for third grade literacy in 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 um in my district what's What's my goal for numeracy for kids? What are, is my goal for kids that are graduating and the, the kinds of academic um, and, and you know, vocational and other opportunities that we have created for them? Are they college, career, military ready? And, and many times we adopt these goals thinking about the average as a whole. This is important. And I don't want to diminish that, 
that kind of goal. But the SGS journey entails adding another lens to the goal setting process. And it is, how are my kids experiencing this system? Because if, again, if I can look at the average of third grade reading, and if I have half my kids that are mastering grade level and the other half of my kids um, that are you know, not meeting grade level at all, um, that's, that's, a, that's a high degree of disequity. And so what, what is important for SGS districts is to set a North Star goal about the school experience for students. What percentage of my kids are in A and B seats? Because then you start to look at the system a little differently. It begins to un unlock a set of actions tied to, to achieving that goal improvement about, you know what, if, if my goal is, the, is getting more kids in A and B seats, have I thought about expanding my A and B campuses? Literally like, you know, adding a wing, adding portables, expanding the number of kids in those campuses. Cause that's a fairly easy thing operationally to do in the, you know, the pantheon of operational choices that we have to make. Cause then I can just put more kids into that school. They can, they can experience the culture of that building. Um, you know, that this is, this, this is an, um, if you're relentlessly focused on goals around the equity of the student experience by campus, it starts to unlock a set of, of operational changes that we are sometimes blind to. This is, this is um, I think, the key, key portion of getting started um, is thinking about this North Star goal that, um, that board members, that districts, wanted, uh, leadership teams want to, want to create for their students. But it's also about, um, it's also about planning in an aligned fashion. Again, you don't pursue random acts of kindness. You think, okay, that one school that's an A campus, can I, can I add another wing to that campus? Can I add some portable stuff? Can I get, can, it's, is the school even at capacity? Forget construction. Maybe it's only got 85% of the kids um, that are capable of being served in that building. Can I just serve more kids in the building? That's one thing. Yes, but I, I got to be, again, methodical about it. I want to analyze school performance in a very methodical way um, uh, in every way that performance exists. And the A through F system is very strong in, in telling us how the schools perform from a standpoint of literacy and numeracy and at the high school level from a standpoint of, of college career military readiness. But often there's more to schools than that. I think about student surveys and climate surveys. I think um, uh, about the, the way that our schools, their students feel. I think about analyzing special education practices um, and, um, and the, the sort of broader culture and climate of, these, of, of our schools. I mean, this is, this is getting very focused on um, first know thyself, um, not, you know, not randomly, but systematically, but also understanding what parents and students want in a very structured, methodical way. Do you really understand exactly what kind of experience your, your, your students and your parents want to have? Uh, I'll give a great example of this. We rolled out a small, a very small program in the last year, it was a COVID response program. We call it Supplemental Special Education Services. And it was, um, we, we identified the most significantly at risk um, uh, uh, families in special education, students with very significant cognitive um, disabilities. Um, and we basically gave the parents extra, extra resources to buy, say, um, you know, uh, sensory tools in the house for their kids. Um, we did this because we asked parents what they thought they needed um, to get through the crisis. Um, and what they needed in many cases was so individualized, there was no easy way for us to systematically deliver it. If you are engaging in SGS, you are getting very focused on exactly what your parents and your kids think they need uh, and want and figuring out ways without ideological brown, uh, blinders to give them what it is that they need. Because that's, uh, that's what we want to do. We want to create an educational system for our kids that gets all kids um, ready for success at the end of that journey. Um, and, you know, our kids certainly have patterns, but they are highly individualized. And figuring out how to create that differentiated experience for our families and our kids inside school buildings, um, inside these big bureaucracies, it's difficult. Uh, but, but starting with a, a a rigorous uh, approach to analyzing what our families need is part of the process. 
we have in at this conference today, we have uh, folks that have been in the journey for uh, several years. We got folks that are in the journey just getting started. And I want to highlight some of this in, in Lever 1 in particular, Lubbock. The, the board has gone through a very methodical goal setting process with their uh, senior leadership team. I've adopted a North Star goal about the students' experience of the schools. Um, and this has pushed the, the Lubbock to go through a very methodical planning process, um, bringing quantitative and qualitative rigor to the process in ways that, um, well, you can listen for themselves. They're, they're going to uh, uh, talk today at uh, 1130 to 1 in one of the sessions. Um, but, you know, they categorized the nature of academic change that was happening in schools as well as academic proficiency. This isn't just a growth of kids in the school building. It's literally like, how is this building uh, tr uh, trending? How is this, how is this school as a community tr trending? And they, they then, once they understood and saw this, really for the first time, they started planning different kinds of supports and actions for different campuses, treating two different A campuses differently. Um, this is a this is a you know remarkable uh, adjustment in uh, systemization in Lubbock, and it's just uh, kudos to our you know your really brilliant, thoughtful, reflective school leaders. Um, the, the again the board and the leadership team of the district um, thinking in, um, in, in as a as a governing team. The board focusing on high level goals, um, and the um, uh, and the administrative team doing at bats on strategic action plans. Um, you know, iteratively uh, uh, bringing more and more uh, rigor to that planning process, presenting it to the board, um, uh, you know, reviewing it, getting some feedback on again and again and again. So um, huge kudos to our folks in, in Lubbock uh, uh, for their lever one work. Oh, and I think lever two, um, you know, you start again with setting a, um, a goal process um, and, uh, and building, uh, you know, collective planning um, uh, for this. But you know, the rubber meets the road on execution. Um, you got to get relentless on um, on acting on this. And what I will say is uh, there is a there is a belief system that comes from practical experience in SGS districts about the kinds of things that we need to do um, in our districts. And let me talk for a moment about um, iterative improvement in school culture. We, you know, for a hundred years, we have had both schools that are highly successful and schools that are struggling. We have seen schools that are highly successful backslide. We have schools that are seen schools that are struggling improve. And um, a go-to move for us in education has been, okay, we've got these, this group of educators that are, that are at a school that is not performing as well as we would like it to be. Let's take a few people from that school Let's send them to another school that's getting you know, better, have them see uh, practices. Let's send them to, to training. Let's, have, uh, let's invest in our teams in those campuses. Um, in some cases, we'll change out the leadership teams, um, uh, change the principal. We will, we will work very, very hard to improve the way that that school performs. In some, in some cases, we go one step further. We know, you know what, we need a holistic redesign. We're gonna look at curriculum top to bottom. We're gonna look at master schedule. Um, uh, 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 we wanna take this campus and redesign it in some notable way. The, the, you know, the interesting thing about that, so it works, it does. Like we, we have ample example of, of school improvement and redesign working, but it's hard. It is because what you are effectively attempting to do is we are we are taking the sum total of behavior at a given campus. And we are trying to change the sum total of that behavior to tilt it. Um, this is this is the practice of driving cultural change. And, you know, we're again, we're pretty good at it. We do this all the time in education. But I, um, you know, many of you all know um, you know, my background is not, I'm not, a, you know, an educator by trade. I've, you know, worked in the private sector, a grand capitalist uh, making money. And I reflect on other parts of, uh, of our world, uh, of America. And I reflect on this process of iterative improvement and, uh, and redesign, which happens, you know, companies try to remake themselves all the time. But that's fundamentally not how the economy works. That is not how for example, grocery delivery in the United States um, uh, got to its level of sophistication. 
I, I talked to a, uh, some folks um, who uh, grew up in Soviet Russia, and they, um, I, I remember this, this, this conversation with, with one of them, and it was really stark because they, um, they had a chance um, to come to the United States in like the late 80s, uh, and they just went to uh, a neighborhood grocery store, and, and they were like, we have nothing like this. It doesn't look anything like this. This is amazing. Is this is this like the richest neighborhood in America? And I was like, no, it's just a kind of a normal grocery store. What what we do in grocery delivery, if if you got a if you got a grocery store that is not performing well, let's let's say uh, not to call out any brand, but let's say there's an Albertsons that's like that you know it's not it's poorly stocked, it's not it's not functioning well. You know the the go to move in the private sector is not let's take that you know that team at Albertsons and send them over to HEB where they're knocking it out of the park and try to learn what they're doing at HEB and bring it back and change um, Albertsons. I mean, companies individually do that, but that's not how grocery delivery improves. The way grocery delivery improves is the strong, the strong thrive and the weak get replaced. Uh, eventually, the Albertsons or the food line or whatever else, if it's not meeting the needs of its customers, it ceases to be. And in the ashes of that, a new store rises up, um, and HEB basically expands. <laughs> this is this is the way improvement happens in every other sector. Uh, it is a it is a dynamic and somewhat disruptive um, set of changes. But when you reflect on the the process of driving cultural change, how much easier is it for HEB that has got culture right and management right and personnel and hiring and onboarding and and operating procedures and and the logistics of food um, ordering and everything out, and the way they stock their shelves, everything. How much easier is it for them just to open up another store? Porting that culture, their their management team, that um, that that um, that flavor of of operation. How much easier is it for them to do that and get it right than it is for some dying grocery store to reinvent itself? Every once in a while, dying grocery stores do reinvent themselves. They do improve. But um, what is much more successful and what has proven to be much more successful in the long run are these actions where um, great uh, operators expand. And when I think about when what it means to remove ideological blinders in education, what it removes, to, what it means to think differently about our buildings, no longer as brick and mortar and classrooms and teachers and books and desks. Uh, uh, this is what I start to think about, about removing these blinders, about opening ourselves, being willing to take different actions at a much more frequent scale. We think about what we do with existing low performing schools. Yes, we should work to invest and change the culture of those campuses to improve them. In many cases, yes, we should fundamentally redesign them. But if you've got, you know, I don't know, an all girls um, middle school over here that has got curriculum figured out and culture and schedule and after school programming and wraparound services and the whole nine. Like, doesn't it make sense to like incubate another management team inside that school and let them run another school? Um, if you've got some campus that is high performing, that's got space to take more kids, expand it. Let them take more kids. Launch new schools that are district run, partner run, um, uh, in combination. You know, the, the, this, is, this is about the, the, the question of how quickly can we drive change, not from an F to a D to a C, but from an F to an A, from an A to an A plus, in ways that expand that access to that kind of culture, that kind of rigorous academic experience for kids as rapidly as possible. I think SGS districts are fundamentally um, uh, open and re uh, uh, to pursuing and relentless in their pursuit of more great options for their kids. They, they yes, they drive improvement and execute school improvement strategies because we're going to have to. It is a it is a play we must continue to call. But instead of like 95% improvement and 5% action. Let's let's see a much more of a balance between the two. I don't know, 50-50, as it were. Um, this is 
when you think about connecting expanding grade options to being focused on annual planning. This is what we see in SGS districts. Um, uh, uh, again, highlighting a couple of our SGS districts that are, that, are, that are getting relentless in their focus on expanding options for kids, Fort Worth, Victoria. Um, uh, they've launched calls for quality schools that said, you know what? If you have a high performing school, if you have the ability to create a high performing environment for our kids, we wanna talk to you. Um, and they, they uh, are offering schools that their families want. Um, uh, Victoria authorized a focused early childhood education academy um, built by the absolute experts in early childhood education at Children's Learning Institute, I think at the University of Houston. Um, um, Phelan Leadership Academy, um, a strong track record of performance, interestingly, outside the state of Texas, Fort Worth bringing them into Texas um, to help drive very rapid uh, changes in culture and, and curricular rigor and talent management um, for, for kids. This is, um, this is about, uh, being not just open, but being systematically focused and relentless on, we want our kids to have access to a caliber culture, to a caliber rigor, to a caliber, you know, business operating uh, procedures. This is, this is, this is what we've got to do. Um, we think about providing equitable access, uh, to options. Um, lever three, if, if, if we're going to, if we're going to start seeing differentiation in these options, um, it does require a journey of change in creating more equitable supports for families. Yes. You got the concept of differentiated, um, school options. This starts to mean maybe we shouldn't put kids in buildings based upon their geographic zone. Maybe we should start talking to families about finding a best fit school for their kids. This slowly dissolving. Um, attendance boundaries about creating open enrollment. You know, this isn't in many places. This is deeply unpopular. I, I mean, I recognize this. I, you know, nothing was as fun as the school board meetings where we were voting uh, to change attendance boundaries in in Dallas. But I mean, one thing I reflect on my own educational journey. The so it's weird the path that God puts you on in life. I grew up in Garland. Garland's been open enrollment for like forty years. It was a, it was a, a total open enrollment choice district when I was a kid in Garland. Um, so, um, it is being done and when it's done well, um, uh, you can promote socioeconomic integration in schools like never before, because our neighborhoods are so often segregated. But when you start to have choice, when, you know, your neighborhood is not necessarily the thing that dictates what school you enroll in, um, you can see a, a much higher degree of differentiation. All the ISD, um, is, um, is, is creating this kind of structural support. They've got a bunch of differentiated school options and they're now getting far more focused on the kind of unified enrollment system and transportation system. Because of course, enrollment without transportation is not necessarily option for every family. And so the, the, uh, these kinds of changes, um, very, um, uh, exciting to see uh, again, speeding up the path between where we are today and where we what the what we want reality to be for our kids in the future. This this requires different organizational structures. It requires a different focus on uh, delivering change. So um, huge um, uh, huge huge kudos to Aldean. They're doing a, a session on this later today, um, uh, where where uh, folks can can learn more about their journey. Um, uh, last but not least, we, we have got to talk about bureaucracy. <laughs> um, there is no way um, uh, to, to, to drive this kind of change without significant changes in operational structure, without significant changes in business operating procedures inside school districts. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a great old, uh, you know, additive that, you know, form follows function. If our functions if our goals for kids are changing, uh, the, the way that we're approaching those, um, uh, those goals is changing. If, if that is the function we wish to, ex um, to experience, we want a, a functional environment where all of our kids are in A and B seats and eventually they're all in A seats with high, highly um, differentiated um, learning environments um, uh, uh, designed to suit their needs, to fit the, the desires of their families. You know, form must follow that function. And I wanna, I wanna talk about what that, what that looks like today and what that 
And, and the way that that functional structure will in fact hinder our success. If we're creating these really differentiated options, learning options for kids, you think at the high school level, you know, I, I want an IB experience, I want even a P-Tech aerospace experience for kids. Those things do not look all that similar to one another. Yes, you have children of the same age range. Yes, the core foundational subjects, English, math, science, and social studies, those experiences, um, the, the core, some of the core content is consistent. But uh, beyond that, it starts looking really different really quickly. Um, imagine embedding all of your math lessons, um, uh, the, the design of your mathematics curriculum, so that uh, kids will wrench from an engineering perspective on planes. <laughs> Um, this is not, I'm just following a lesson in calculus. This is like, I'm doing calculus. Um, uh, and so the kids in that P-TECH uh, model are going to see a different curricular experience than the kids in that IB uh, high school. At the middle school level, now um, you got differentiation in terms of the curricular experience. You got an all boys military school. So what, again, what kind of curricular experience with the cadence of the school schedule? I mean, I think like a military school for all boys, you better be up at six o'clock in the morning, you know, doing drills and physical fitness. That That's going to look different. Um, uh, and um, as opposed to an IB school where you're doing a lot of world studies or a traditional school, I mean, like they're going to have fundamentally different schedules, different busing. Um, uh, um, and this is before, like, this is on top of the fact that like, you know, uh, 11 year olds and 17 year olds, um, th those are different year olds. Uh, you know, the, the brain is getting bathed in hormones, uh, going through this fundamental restructuring for kids that are in middle school and the kinds of like character development, the emotional supports that you're going to build, um, for kids while they're while they're undergoing the changes in the human mind that is caused by uh, puberty, that's you know that's going to be different than both elementary and high school, which I know a lot of educators on this call can attest to. And the kinds of experiences that you need, the at bats you need to get really good. Um, I mean, you need a lot of at bats to get good. This is um, you know think of Malcolm Gladwell and the, with the ten thousand hours stuff. Like, can you just switch from being a a teacher? Um, teaching, um, you know, integrated cross-curricular foundational literacy in, uh, uh, to, to kindergartners to teach in high school mathematics. Like, we don't, we don't think that that's necessarily a good call at the teacher level. Why is it a good call at the assistant principal and principal level? Because the kinds of supports that you need to be able to provide, the way that coached your teachers, like, you got to know the content, you got to know the curricular rigor, the instructional experience. And you got to know it well in order to coach teams up. So if you have like one executive director that oversees school leadership for all of these campuses, tell me how that can possibly be a recipe for excellence. Because aren't we burdening that executive director by giving them a job that is fundamentally undoable at, at a level of excellence? But this is what our org structures generally look like. Sometimes we differentiate. We don't do it by feeder pattern. Sometimes we differentiate by elementary and high school. That's also good. But then you think about the issues of curricular alignment that um, can can sometimes break down there. So the 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 very organizational structures, the bureaucratic structures that we have uh, in our districts, we've got to think about what they look like in order for, again, form to follow function, in order for us to reinforce excellence at scale. This is, this is important. And this is not like, you know, an academic exercise because we have got to, in order to achieve, you know, truly A level performance where 100% of kids or 95% of kids are meeting grade level at, um, at the level of, in, in, in reading and math, and they're all getting um, on fire for some sort of leadership development activity, some sort of extracurricular activity, then our instructional coaches and the bosses of our instructional coaches, the people who are leading that environment, they, they need a degree of expertise in all of that underlying content. Um, you know, think about the, the history, the etymology of the word principal, actually. Um, the, the, uh, principle that uh, originated with the concept of principal instructor. That's that's where that word comes from. Very interesting, different history of the word superintendent that came from like building super, the person who was just going to fix pipes. Um, uh, this is not what superintendents can do anymore. But um, that was the history of superintendent. But the history of principal 
was actually the dedicated instructional leader. Um, uh, this is not the three B's, books, buses, and butts. This is somebody who you know can step in and fill in um, uh, to teach a class. Uh, often you would see uh, you know principals teaching like civics um, uh, to kids um, uh, in in you know back in the 1890s, 19 early 1900s. This is this is what we've got to think about in terms of our very org structures. So um, it, oftentimes what you will see SGS districts is they will begin to make these kinds of significant organizational model shifts. So their districts just look different. Like the org chart looks different in those in those um, um, in those districts where they go through a annual portfolio process at the cabinet level, um, examining all aspects of operation. Because if if we are going to really focus on the academic needs of our kids and see about the, the experiences they have, then we better drive every bit of efficiency in busing and food service and everything else that we've got. Like it's being relentless on all aspects of performance, understanding performance and need um, across the system. But uh, in some cases, you think about who is managing instruction, who is driving curricular um, uh, change, who is thinking through master schedule. Do we standardize that from the top down um, or do we uh, uh, allow for a degree of differentiation? Now, this is fraught with peril because I I've never been to an excellent school that didn't strongly manage instruction, that didn't have a very strong a uh, coherent, calibrated understanding across all the teachers, across all the administrators at that campus about exactly what grade level rigor was, about exactly what the, the student experience was, a very common experience. Equity um, often means making sure kids in classroom A and kids in classroom B have the same access to opportunities, which means a, a, a degree of calibration even inside the school. So I don't see successful schools where we don't have very, very strong approaches to managing instruction. The question is what operational unit for the district should be managing instruction? Have we created um, uh, a, a vertical ex expectation that everyone is teaching the same thing at the same time, same curriculum for all of our schools? Well, if that's the, if that's the case, how do we have really differentiated curricular experiences? Because that would imply a central office that has experts on absolutely everything, IB and PTECH, um, a, a, a absolute experts on, you know, learning, uh, play-based learning that you see in pre-kindergarten and, and family um, uh, support structures there, as well as excellence at the high school CTE level, because uh, it's all, you know, again, all coming down, straight down. The flip side is if it's not centrally managed and it's just managed at the, at the building level by the principals, then we better have principals who are absolute experts on all aspects of the pedagogy that's happening in those buildings, which is not always the case. Um, so how do we create experiences, uh, organization structures, so our principals can have multiple at-bats of sort of linking um, schools horizontally, as it were, where all of my IB schools I am organizing together uh, in one management chain. This is sort of a horizontal as opposed to a vertical uh, focus. And if I'm partnering with folks who are true experts in, you know, aerospace, maybe that just recognizing maybe that ain't me. Maybe that's somebody else. Uh, you know, you got the Young Women's Leadership uh, Academy that uh, they have now, uh, you know, this the nonprofit organizations build all this expertise on building young women's leadership schools. Um, how do we use their expertise to actually um, uh, strengthen our own district structures? So we, we see districts going in this direction where they're not just creating an office of innovation, but they are actually um, uh, explicitly changing organization structures um, uh, top to bottom in in the uh, inside the district to become much more of a networked district um, as opposed to a command and control district. Empowering groups of educators to gain experience and expertise to have the at bats necessary to drive towards excellence. Because I mean, there's even a difference between a low A and a high A, folks, in terms of the, the quality of execution classroom by classroom by classroom in a school. Um, and so kudos to San Antonio that has, has uh, since 2017, cut the number of, of uh, DNF campuses by 80% in terms of the students experience in those campuses. Still room to grow on excellence, right? Because part of it is let's eliminate, let's eliminate bad. But, you know, no system achieves excellence just by eliminating bad. You have to focus on how to replicate and expand good. 
So um, San Antonio is well on their way to, to do this. And they are, they are a highly networked school system now. They got formalized, structured performance management partnerships with all these kinds of organizations. Um, and they are reorienting central office, not to make every decision, um, but to create every support that is necessary to empower the uh, folks closest to kids to make the decisions that uh, they need to make. And again, you know, with great freedom comes great responsibility. So you have to have the right structures to do that well. Um, yeah, um, just giving high degrees of autonomy without the right kind of structured support is not a recipe for uh, improvements in equity or excellence. Um, uh, it's, it's actually a recipe for the opposite. <laughs> So um, they'll have a, a workshop uh, coming up soon, actually, on uh, the, the kinds of changes um, uh, that they're driving. Again, kudos to, to San Antonio. You know, but again, I reflect on all of this, and it's, um, you know, we had challenges associated with what we needed to do to improve the achievement gap long before COVID reared its head. Those challenges have gotten multiplied by a factor of really three. Um, I've kind of quantified the impact. It's it's vastly more challenging post, um, post COVID. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a truism about systems, um, theory that, you know, any system is, is perfectly designed to get the results that it's currently getting. What, what gets me so excited about the group of leaders in this room, board members, superintendents, um, uh, senior leadership teams, campus leaders that are, that are part of, part of uh, the, the SGS network is um, this is a group of leaders that recognize like there are limitations in the way that we've designed our system. And um, this is not about like teachers working harder or principals working harder. This is not how we get um, excellence because like we have people who work hard. That's not, that's not the issue. It's the system within which they work. It is the very system that is going to have to change in some fundamental structural ways in order for us to deliver the kind of equitable experience that our kids really need, in order for us to get to excellence. And equitable ain't about limiting what the, you know, the experience at the top. It's about raising the, the floor as rapidly as possible, raising everyone, but being, being focused on how to raise the floor faster, how to, how to be disproportionately beneficial to, to, um, to some kids while not, um, not throttling any. This, you know, um, it's, I'm just excited to be in this room and I'm grateful for, uh, for all the brain power and, and, um, and focus on this. I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm a former school board member and I, I'm reflecting on how hard this work really is. It is hard for administrators. Uh, it is hard to, you know, we're, we're faced with wave after wave after wave uh, that is just crashing over our heads, um, that we've got to respond to this crisis and that crisis. And in order to make these kinds of changes, we have to be able to raise ourselves up above the waves. And by the way, the waves got kind of big this year, <laughs> but we've got to, so we've got to raise ourselves up even higher than we normally do and be able to see what the ocean looks like far, um, uh, far afield from, from this beach that we're on. That this is this is part of it and creating the space for that leadership, creating space for that deep thought and engagement, uh, creating structures that can be reflective. This is not managerially easy. This is not something that, you know, just comes naturally in superintendent school. Um, it's 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 stuff that takes real work. It's also stuff that is. Going to fail, I mean, like you're not going to take risks without failure. This is, this is fundamental to the learning journey for our kids. There is no learning without failure. For our kids, there is no learning in our classrooms without them failing some assignments, without them struggling to, to, to work through the material, making mistakes um, um, uh, and you know, rising above those mistakes, learning from them. That's the same that our management teams, our leadership teams, boards, your superintendents are humans. They are fallible. They are flawed. They will make mistakes on this way. So can you can create, can we collectively create this space for innovative risk taking, a true culture of servant leadership that says like, we're, you know, when there's bad news, let's, let's, let's surface that bad news quickly. Uh, when there's good news, let's surface that quickly, not dwell, not celebrate the, the, um, for, for weeks on our, on our, uh, on our successes, let's recognize them, 
And then more importantly, let's, why were we successful? Let's reflect on why we were successful and can we be more successful? Can we spread that success? Let's not dwell, uh, you know, have wailing and gnashing of teeth on the failures that occurred. We will fail, but why did the failure occur? What can we learn from it? How can we change our practices? And, you know, boards, um, boards in particular, so much of your role is translating the, the, um, this for your community, helping uh, represent the values and vision of your community and how the district operates, but also then help, help um, educating uh, the community about these kinds of changes. Because um, especially when you get into, you know, creating more equitable opportunities for kids will sometimes mean doing very interesting thing to, to attendance boundaries. Um, and nothing makes real estate agents um, uh, as, uh, as upset as, uh, as those votes. So um, I commend everybody on this uh, call for their creativity, their thoughtfulness, and their bravery um, for, you know, for being part of this journey of improvement because um, our kids are really counting on us. So anyways. That's uh, that's pretty much all I got to say about that. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Um, uh, I don't know if, if there's in the last few minutes if we have any um, um, uh, questions or comments, but um, again, just grateful for this this group and the brain power of this group. Thank you, Commissioner Morath. I think one of the downsides of virtual events is that uh, there is a you know there isn't a moment of applause. Uh, but I've seen a lot of resonant chats coming through in the chat box, and uh, do jump in and just join me in thanking the commissioner and sharing any other comments for you. Uh, I think in these couple minutes we've got left here before ten, Commissioner, I'm curious. Do you have any advice for districts who are just now starting their SGS journey? Um. Uh, you know, it's a good question. I feel like we need, um, they're, 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 you can, I can give you whatever advice I might give you, but uh, it is the, the folks that are, say, two, three uh, years in, four years in at this point that are probably better suited to give you um, uh, advice. Uh, you know, I think, again, it's, this is, this is a, uh, this is a journey, not a destination. Um, and, um, you know, being, um, being learners uh, as board members, as leadership teams, um, is part of the equation to seek um, um, explanations, to seek opportunities, to you know not make excuses. Uh, the the results are what the results are, and there you know there's a lot of people that say, well, this results uh, we can't count on it for this reason, or this result that we can't count on this reason. Lord knows there's a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth about this the, the star test, but these things are all meaningful. They all tell us things that, um, uh, that matter. The, the question is then what do we do with it to, to create the opportunities for change for our kids? Appreciate that. Uh, very helpful advice as folks uh, start out on this journey. Um, thank you all. Uh, we are almost at the hour. Um, thank you for joining us, Commissioner Marath. Uh, and we will have Dr. Deborah Gist as our keynote speaker at 1015. Uh, so, much as you all might have experienced the transition between the start of the, you know, the earlier session and the start of the commissioner's opening remarks here, you might see a pop-up that gives you an option to join uh, the keynote address with Dr. Gist. Uh, we do have a 15-minute break here, uh, so we will see you in just a little bit at 10.15. Thank you all. <laughs>